Hi, Chan. How are you? How are you? Good to see you. Good. Nice to see you. Are you in Tianjin? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'm in Shanghai. Oh, oh good. Good. Yeah, I, I am wondering. I see uh, you're, you're in the daytime. So. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Good. I was just in Beijing last week. Uh, well, it's um, uh, there's a uh, one case was identified, and uh, right now there's uh, uh, the control has been tighter over the past few days. So, yeah. um, but so far there are no. Uh, I didn't see. I didn't uh, read the news today, but um, looks likely there are new, no more new cases at least for now uh, being reported. So, things may get better in the upcoming weeks, hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, my wife is going to Beijing today. Oh, oh, okay. So, uh, so when when did she uh, arrive uh, Beijing? No, oh, she's uh, going today. She's going. Oh, she's today. going today. Okay. So, they said on the news that they're mm -hmm. that they think this case came from the mail from some package, but that that doesn't make sense to me. Um, I I didn't get into a lot of details, but. Uh, I, I just uh, heard that, I mean, so the, the case went to, uh, uh, have been to uh, many places, shopping more than. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And then is Tianjin still locked down? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's not uh, completely locked down because uh, people can still, uh, at, at least people in most places, they can, they can still work around. Um, mm -hmm. like if I, I if I go to go to work, I can. I mean, it's a our community still allow that. <laughs> uh, but is I your code like travel is, outside? Is your travel code green or is it yellow, red? Uh, travel code is still green. Still green. Green. Oh, okay. Green. Okay. Yeah. But the what issue about, is, um, yeah, if you Beijing. want to go to other cities, like uh, if yeah. you want to go to Beijing, and then you not just a uh, travel code, you need a uh, like. Can come out. Test negative. The proof yeah. and so yeah. additional, yeah. I mean, some, something like a paperwork. <laughs> is is your um, Beijing Jin Kung Bao green or no? That should be green. Yeah. Should be. Oh, okay, that's good. Do you want to um, test out your slides? Uh yeah, yeah. So, okay. so I can share right now. Okay. Can you see? Uh, uh, yep. Um, maybe just do the, okay. the the do the slideshow view. Okay. So I'm going to uh, stop. If you no no, can you do the do the slideshow view? Ah, okay. So uh, am I still sharing a slide? Or... Uh, no, no, no. Yeah. Okay. It's a 20 minute talk, so I, I don't have many slides. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I, still don't, I still don't see the slideshow view yet. Can, can you see right now or? Um... I can see it. Oh, you can yeah. see. Yeah. Okay. Right, Probably maybe there's some delay on the internet. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Hi, Aaron. So you, oh, hey, okay. wait. Okay. okay. All right. Okay. You, yeah, so hi, you, hi, Doc, wait. <laughs> Hi, Zhang. <laughs> nice to meet you. you. So, wait, you, you saw it in the, in, oh, no, 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 uh, Chung, can you put it in the um, slideshow view? All right. Do you know, like, if you're giving a presentation, okay. like, press, press this button here. Mm -hmm. I just circled, I just circled it. Press that button. Mm -hmm. Can you can you do that? I, yeah, I, I don't. I'm, I'm I'm playing the slides right now. Yeah, one by no, one. No, 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 no! Don't play the slides. Just press <laughs> slideshow view or go to view slideshow. Right. 
How about now? Um, I I don't see, wait. Do you see it as a slideshow view or still? In... No, no. I still yeah. see the normal view. Okay. It's so, a it's Chandra. a full screen on my on my computer right now. So, uh, it's yeah. It's already full screen. Um, okay, so you have to then change the display somehow because we we Maybe don't see I, it. I, I I reset. Yeah, I start over. Okay. Meanwhile, uh, Wei, can you check your slides? Okay. Me, now I'm not sure about mine. Okay. You want to uh, go first? Yeah. Okay, I can try mine, and uh, if I do um, presentation view, do you see mine? Yeah, that looks good. Perfect. Okay. 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 Cool. And then I'll stop sharing. Yeah. Yeah. So it what Chang? We want it to look like that. Yeah. Sure. One more time. Um. How about now? The, um. No. No. Yeah. Now? Click that. Wait. Yeah. That works. Okay. Uh, no, no. 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 I don't no. see it. No. You don't see. It? I go uh, go to go to view go um go go to a, um. Here, yeah, I'm uh, to slide show on my computer. No, so. go to go to view, and then do um, click that. Mm -hmm. Um, oh wait, maybe uh, oh no, go okay, maybe slideshow. Would I be able like, here? Slide show on the on the right hand and bottom. Okay, All right, click. Maybe uh, no. From beginning. Yeah. Okay. That works. No, not yet. Well, it works on my side. I don't know. <laughs> and you, maybe, um, maybe yeah. uh, untick the use presenter view. You see the use presenter view. The um, uh, presenter view. There will be. Uh, let me see. Uh, on, on, remove untick. this check mark here. Remove yeah. that check mark. Remove this. Oh, okay. Okay. Now try it. You have to remove it. It's not removed. It's not removed. I'll remove. Okay. Oh, I remove. Check. Uncheck. Yeah. And then try it. How about now? That works. No. No. It's weird. Let me let do me you, start over. <laughs> I will close you, my uh, program and reset. Do you have multiple s displays or something? Uh. I only have a PowerPoint in my uh, computer. Do you have multiple monitors? Um, no, only one. Okay. Um, um, okay, try again. Let me let me share again. It's not a problem. We can always do it in this view if we need to, but uh, um, now, now it's better. Now you can no. see the full screen. Still no. 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 That's that's weird to me. Um, yeah. Maybe, I wonder so, if you if you click share screen, you might have multiple options of how to yeah, share. Just, how about yeah. now? Wait just a second. Wait. That, yeah. It's not ideal, but it's a, that could be okay. But try to try to oh, click on. Oh, it works. Wait, wait, just, just a second. It, mm -hmm. it works like a second. Oh yeah, that's good. Wait, that was good. What yeah, yes, it's, it's uh, you click, click again, try again. I saw the full screen for for a few seconds. Yeah, it should work. So here is the overview of all slides. We don't want that. We want this. We want this, okay. this slideshow view. Wait. Why? Why just no. stop? Oh. Not now. It works. No, no, no. Black screen. Try again. Yeah. Not sure. What is going on here? In my computer, <laughs> it's already full screen. Um, there's something wrong with your display settings then, because maybe oh. you're seeing something different than we are. I 
right. We, um, present uh, from the. Oh wait, primary Pri monitor. Change, try and change the primary. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not, not try it. So how is it? Hold on a second. No. Is this slow? Awesome? Maybe it's slow. Is your yeah? All right. I guess that we'll have to live with this the way it is now. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, That's okay. It's long. Maybe you could have some sort of symposium where you we talk about how to give Zoom presentations in PowerPoint. We can do that later. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, right. Okay, we'll, we'll do that. Uh, can you, Chang, can you stop sharing so I can do the introduction? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Okay, yeah, fine. Okay. So should I get started? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay, hi, hi everyone, uh, welcome to another uh, week of NeuroZoom and um, looking forward to hearing from Chang and uh, Wei. But before we get, get started, um, uh, just to let you know that uh, next week we have two more talks. We have another talk about uh, visual cortex uh, from Colin at Girl Spectre, my colleague at Stanford. And we have a talk um, about new optogenic uh, sensors from Andre Burnt at University of uh, Washington. So please tune in uh, for those talks. And now it's my uh, great pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Dr. Wei Wei. Uh, Wei Wei is an associate professor uh, in the University of Chicago. She received her uh, bachelor's degree um, in Australia at the University of Melbourne, then did um, a PhD with Roberto Malino at Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. And here she worked on uh, the role uh, or the effect of amyloid beta um, produced um, from axons and dendrites and the, the effect on um, spines and plasticity. She then came to California to do a postdoctoral fellowship with Marla Feller at uh, UC Berkeley. And uh, here she started to study the retina and she um, had a really uh, amazing famous paper in Nature where she um, studied the properties of um, direction sensitive ganglion cells. And these are the cells in the retina that um, are responsible for the initial computations to detect uh, motion in the visual system. And um, the, uh, they're direction sensitive because the ones that um, detect direction in one way, fire a lot, and the ones in the opposite direction uh, fire minimally. And she, it was a big question of how the wiring is set up um, to have this effect. And uh, she figured this all out in, in a paper in Nature. And she found that uh, synapses on the, strong, on the positive side are strengthened and the other ones remain the same. And this wasn't due to activity, but rather due, due to some developmental program that happened in the second uh, week. So uh, this launched her independent career at the University of Chicago and uh, where she continues to study computations um, in the visual system. And she's won the uh, Whitehall Foundation grant, uh, the Sloan Research Fellowship, pretty much every award you can win, the Midnight Scholar Award. And um, she's a wonderful neuroscientist and really looking forward to hearing her latest. Go ahead, Wei. Okay, thanks so much, Aaron, for the kind introduction. Um, and I'd like to first thank you, thanks, uh, uh, thank uh, Aaron and uh, um, Zilong for this great opportunity. So my lab is interested in understanding how neuronal signals are transformed by synapses, by dendrites, and by circuits during sensory processing. And a prominent example of sensory processing is the direction selectivity um, in the visual system. This property was first discovered by Hubel and Wiesel in a cat primary visual cortex, where they found some cortical neurons respond strongly when a visual stimulus moves in one direction, but not the opposite direction. And a few years later, direction selectivity was discovered at the earliest stage of visual processing in the mammalian retina. Their Barlow and Levick characterized direction selected ganglion cells in the rabbit 
and also and show that their responses are also tuned to the direction of motion. And since then, direction selectivity in the retina has been a classic model to study neural computation because of its relative accessibility to experiments. So in the next slide, I'm going to introduce a key mechanism underlying direction selectivity in the retina. So oh, hey, wait, huh? wait, you have to, sorry, you have to share your slide. Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, uh, gosh. Uh, I need to share my slide, right? Yeah, sorry about uh, that. Okay, thanks for catching that early. Um, wait. There. Um, do you see the presenter view now? Yeah, perfect. Okay, so I'm here. <laughs> so in the next slide, um, I'm going, I will introduce the key mechanism underlying direction selectivity in the retina. So this is an example recording from our lab from the mouse retina. And we are recording spiking activity from a direction selective ganglion cell and show, while well showing a moving bar stimulus. And here, when a bar is moving to the left, uh, this is the preferred direction of the cell, we see lots of action potentials. And in the opposite direction, there's no action potential. And then when we record the inhibitory current the cell receives, we saw that the inhibition the cell receives is also tuned, but to the opposite direction. So in the preferred direction, inhibition is weak and delayed, but in the null direction, inhibition is fast and strong so that it can efficiently veto excitation and prevent spiking. So the source of this directional inhibition comes from a presynaptic interneuron called Stabber's endocrine cell. And this is uh, illustrated in a schematic on the, on the right. So the ganglion cell express GABA-A receptors and receive GABAergic inhibition from Stabber's endocrine cells. And both the Stabber's endocrine cell and the ganglion cell receive light-evoked glutamatergic excitation through this vertical pathway uh, of photoreceptors to bipolar cells. <clears throat> So when the moving bar is in the null direction of the ganglion cell, this triggers maximum GABA release from the stubber cell onto the ganglion cell, causing strong null direction inhibition. So in the past few years in my lab, we have been pursuing several aspects of this motion detection mechanism in the, in the retina. So the first aspect is the implementation of direction selectivity, meaning how direction selectivity is generated by synapses, by dendrites and by circuits. And a second aspect is the contextual modulation, meaning that the direction selective responses can be modulated by the spatial and temporal features in the visual environment. And we'll, we, we aim to uncover neural mechanisms underlying those contextual effects. And the third aspect is the noise resilience. So how is direction selectivity robust under a variety of visual conditions? So today I will focus on the second, uh, on the third topic on the noise resilience. But before I go into details, I'd like to give a special shout out to all the people in my, in my, in my lab have been working on all these aspects in the past few years. And so this is my last cohort of grad students who have now all graduated and went on to, to start postdoc research in amazing labs uh, across the country. So Hector worked on the implementation. He, he specifically worked on the dendritic computation by Stabber's emigrant cells. Lindsay and Jen work on the contextual modulation of the circuit. And Chris work on the noise resilience. So I hope I got more opportunity to show you more uh, studies from, from our group. So go back to the noise resilience. The motivation to study uh, noise resilience is because in a natural environment, the background of the moving stimulus is often not so simple and usually quite noisy. So one example is this duck family swimming across glistening water. And another example on the right is this tree leaves flickering in the wind. So the question we were interested in is how direction selectivity is maintained when the background is noisy. So to address this question, we modified our simple moving bar stimulus to add noise to the background. So we use a parameterizable noise, which is a white noise. This is randomly flickering checkerboard in the background. 
so that we can specifically change parameters of the noise. For example, we can change the intensity of individual flickers to make them brighter or dimmer so that we can vary the intensity of this background noise. So when we show this new noisy bar stimulus to the retina, we see something. Uh, so this is the summary of the results from spiking activity of direction selective ganglion cells. So in this graph, the y-axis is a parameter called DSI or direction selectivity index. This is the normalized difference between the prefer and null direction responses. So the higher the DSI, the more direction selective the cell is. And the, the x-axis is checker intensity expressed as a percentage of the bar brightness. So it's 0% means there's no checker. And 100% means the brightness of the checker is the same as the brightness of the moving bar. So the noise level is pretty high. So in the wild type group, you can see that those ganglion cells maintains direction selectivity over a range of noise levels. And in a previous study, we found that in a conditional knockout mouse line where we only alter one synaptic locus in the retina, we have interesting effect. So if we, so this, this dash line is from this knockout group. If you look at the 0%, meaning there's no noise in the background, the ganglion cell in this knockout group uh, looks normal. They have normal direction selectivity. But as soon as we introduce noise in the background, these cells have impaired direction selectivity meaning that this synaptic locus is not important for the generation of direction selectivity in a noise-free background, but it's very important for maintaining direction selectivity in the presence of noise. So where is this locus? This is shown in the schematic here. So the ganglion cell receive uh, express GABA-A receptors and other retinal neuronal types also express GABA-A receptors, including the established amacrine cells, and bipolar cells. So in particular, Staber's amacrine cells receive GABAergic inhibition from neighboring Staber cells. So there is a serial inhibition motif here, consists of neighboring Staber cells and the ganglion cell. In this conditional knockout mice, this is a GABA-A receptor conditional knockout. The only, uh, so only Staber's amacrine cell uh, miss, uh, lacks functional GABA-A receptors but the rest of the retinal neurons are not affected. So that in this knockout group, the only inhibitory connection that is disrupted is the inhibition onto the stubber cell from neighboring uh, stubber cells. So the rest of the inhibitory circuitry in the, in the retina is intact. Now, when we record ganglion cells from the knockout group, if we show a moving bar stimulus in the absence of any noise in the background, we see normal direction selectivity, so still more uh, spikes in the preferred direction and minimal in the null direction. But when we add noise in the background, then we see impaired direction selectivity in this knockout group because there's additional extra firing in the null direction from this, uh, from this ganglion cells. And in contrast, if we show the same a set of stimulus to a control group, the mouse with intact inhibition of stubber cells, we see normal direction selectivity with or without noise. We also recorded the amount of inhibition the cell received in the knockout group. We found that if we put, if we present the noisy bar stimulus compared to the control group, the knockout cells receive diminished inhibition. So if we disrupt the, the stubber uh, lateral inhibition, we see less inhibition of the ganglion cells in the null direction, but only when there's a noise in the background. So here's the summary. This is the control. This is the knockout group. The, the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, strength of their inhibitory input uh, during the noisy bar the stimulus. So to summarize so far, we found an interesting phenomenon. We see that uh, there is this serial inhibition motif that is not required for the generation of direction selectivity, but is required for maintaining direction selectivity in noise. And in general, this type of zero inhibition is often called disinhibitory circuit, and which consists of two inhibitory neurons, cell one and cell two, before cell two synapse onto the principal neuron, which is usually an excitatory cell. 
And normally, if you block the first inhibitor synapse, we would expect that the principal neuron receive more inhibition because the cell two is now disinhibited. But I just showed you that in our conditional knockout mice, when we disrupt the first inhibitory synapse between the neighboring suburb cells, we saw that the ganglion cell received diminished inhibition. And this effect is only observed when there's noise in the background. So it's very puzzling to us, it was. And so the question was how a disinhibitory motif inverts its computational algorithm when there's noise in, in the visual, in visual background. So to get more clue, we next recorded from the Stabber's amicron cells. <clears throat> so this is current clump recording to record the membrane potential of the Stabber cell during the moving bar stimulus with or without noise. So here is an example recording. This is the wild type Stabber's membrane potential. So during a moving bar stimulus, no noise condition, before the bar reaches the receptive field surround, we see a baseline level of uh, membrane potential. This is the resting membrane potential of the stubborn cell. And then the bar move across the receptive field surround, and we see this typical surround suppression that is often observed in early visual neurons. So this is the hyperpolarization of the membrane potential because of lateral inhibition onto the cell from the surround activation. And then the bar keep continue, keep moving across the center. And then we see depolarization. And this is because the bar evoke excitatory input onto the stubborn cell to depolarize its membrane potential. And this will trigger motion evoke transmitter release from the stubborn cell to the ganglion cell. But in the knockout group, we found that the surround suppression window is impaired. So the stubborn cell in this knockout group are not very effectively suppressed by the receptive field surround activation. So now uh, when we show uh, the noisy bar stimulus, we again record from wild type and uh, knockout stubborn amicron cells. So for the knockout, for the wild type cells, again, when the bar is moving, uh, before the mark bar moves into the receptive field, we see a baseline level of activity. But now you see it's more noisy because the flickering checkerboard background activate noise response in the, in the stubborn cell. And then the moving bar continue to sweep across the surround. And then we again see surround suppression. And you can see that this surround suppression effectively silenced the noise activity of the stubborn cell, followed by the motion evoked depolarization due to the center activation. And then if we look at stubborn amicron cells in the knockout group, we see similar baseline level of noise activity. We also see similar depolarization evoked by the bar in the center. But what is really different is this surround suppression time window where the noise response failed to be suppressed by, by the receptive field surround. And this is because the stubborn cell uh, missed lateral inhibition in this knockout group. So to summarize, the difference between so the response uh, of stubborn cell in the knockout group differs from those in the control group only during the surround suppression window. So the motion evoked surround suppression is impaired so that the noise response can no longer be suppressed prior to the motion response. And so the quantification shows that the baseline activity is similar and also motion evoked depolarization is similar in both groups. So, so the main effect of disrupting lateral inhibition between stubborn amicron cells is the lack of surround suppression and, and suppression of the noise response. And this difference led us to another clue about the stubborn amicron cell property. And so this is a synaptic property. So from previous studies from our, and, and, uh, our group and also Marla Feller's group, we know that the stubborn cell to ganglion cell synapse have a short-term depression. So it's a depressing synapse. And the way to look at depression is by paired recordings. So we can use two electrodes to patch a pair of synaptically connected stubborn and ganglion cells. And we can stimulate the stubborn cell with uh, an electrode and measure the postsynaptic inhibitory response in a ganglion cell. 
So a standard uh, pair pulse protocol is two square wave pulses for stimulating stubber cells and measure the postsynaptic response. And this is an example of depression because the second response is depressed relative to the first response. And this is a typical summary plot plotting the pair pulse ratio at, uh, as a function of interstimulus interval, again showing the short term depression of the synapse. So now we came up with a hypothesis to explain the effect we see in a knockout group. We think in the control condition, the noise evoked activation of stubborn cell is transiently suppressed by motion evoked surround suppression. But in the knockout group, when we disrupt this first inhibitory synapse, Stabber's amprin cell can no longer uh, have a functional surround suppression so that the noise evoked activity cannot be suppressed and persist into this time window right before the motion evoked activation. And this ongoing noise activation leads to short-term depression of the Stabber's synapse so that the Stabber cell releases less GABA onto the ganglion cell during the motion stimulus, even though the Stabber cell is depolarized to the same extent by the motion stimulus. But this prior window that is no longer silent, um, it really matters and, and triggers unwanted synaptic depression in the knockout group. So this is really uh, uh, makes a lot of sense to us, but we, we want to further test this hypothesis because this is, this is a hypothesis based on a genetic uh, knockout line. So next, we want to test this hypothesis in wild-type animals. And also, we want to make sure that this waveform that we see in the knockout animals can indeed trigger synaptic depression, just like the pair pulse protocol that we used uh, for, for this artificial, um, uh, for, uh, uh, artificial um, uh, way of stimulating stubborn cells. So we did another set of experiments now, this time only in the wild type animals. So we, pair, we patched pairs of stubbers and ganglion cells, but instead of stimulating stubber cell with pair pulses, which is uh, the two square pulses to check for depression, we try to mimic the activation of stubber cells in the control versus knockout group during the noisy bar stimulus. So the, the experiment is, uh, example experiment is shown in the slide where the presynaptic stubber cell is activated using one of the two waveforms. So these waveforms are taken from uh, stubber's activity patterns recorded in either knockout group or in the control group. And so in this two waveform, everything is the same except this time window prior to the motion evoked depolarization. So in the knockout group, we see that noise activity persists into the, uh, the surround suppression window right before the motion uh, response. And in the control waveform, we keep everything the same, but we replaced this uh, surround suppression window in the knockout group with uh, the average trace we recorded from the wild type uh, Stabber's amacrine cell in which the noise response is effectively uh, silenced. And then we measure the postsynaptic current in the, in the ganglion cells to randomize uh, stimulation of two waveforms. So in those experiments, we have internal controls because for each pair of Starburst DS pairs, um, we can measure the, uh, the postsynaptic response triggered by the motion waveform, which is the same for control and knockout. And we can also measure the baseline uh, postsynaptic response during the baseline period, again, this is the same for two waveform. But the difference is that in the knockout waveform, there's additional activation of the stubborn cell, just as we see in the, in the knockout uh, stubborn amacrine cells. So to summarize, we, when we look at the, uh, uh, the evoked response in the ganglion cells using the knockout waveform, they show significant depression compared to the response evoked by this control waveform, indicating that additional activation of stubborn cell in this knockout group can indeed trigger synaptic depression. So to conclude, we found that there is this disinhibitory motif in the retina 
that is responsible for the noise resilience of directions activity. And interestingly, this motif performed this noise resilience function, but not with disinhibition. Instead, it's doing the opposite of disinhibition. And this is because the first inhibitory synapse is, is, is important for this center surround receptive field of Staber's amacrine cell. So that when there's noise in the motion background, the center surround receptive field create a specific network dynamics that interact with the window of synaptic plasticity at the second synapse. So this combined interact this interaction between network dynamics and synaptic plasticity leads to an inversion of the algorithm. So instead of this inhibition, now this motif can protect motion evoked inhibition of this principal neuron. And I'd like to end uh, this, uh, this study by trying to generalizing uh, to, to other uh, systems in the brain because these inhibitory motifs are not something unique. They are repeatedly observed in, in many parts of the brain. And it's very well studied in hippocampus and neocortex for example, the VIP positive interneurons are uh, important in mediating, uh, in participating in this disinhibitory motif, and is thought to serve as a, a selective gating mechanism so that when the VIP neuron is activated, it can relieve inhibition of the principal neuron to allow uh, plasticity and, and the sensory processing. And here I, we show that in the retina, a uh, disinhibitory motif can also perform selective gating, but not using this conventional disinhibition. And this is because the interaction of network dynamics and plasticity can actually filter out unwanted inhibition, but preserve feature selective inhibition. So the take home message is that a canonical circuit motif can implement multiple context dependent algorithms. And you know, when you consider interaction between plasticity and network dynamics, there are, there are really this algorithmic uh, flexibility in how a circuit motif can transform incoming signals. So with that, I'd like to thank uh, my, my team and, uh, and our collaborators, particularly uh, this uh, noise uh, project is uh, done by uh, Chris Chang Chen. And uh, our collaborator, Robert Smith at UPenn, help us to do some computational modeling to best, uh, best uh, for us to best approximate the Starburst activity pattern in, a, in our voltage clamp experiments. And also thanks to the funding source. Do I have time for questions? Uh, thanks, Wei. Uh, great talk and time for questions. Uh, can I ask one question? Sure. Yes, please. Okay. So, yeah. So, uh, one question is about the. Uh, uh, have you ever seen any uh, sex difference in effect or any uh, age dependent effect in your discovery? We we haven't. We keep track of the the gender of the mice, um, but from the data set, the the data points are quite. We don't see a binary distribution, so. We haven't uh, checked specifically, but uh, yeah, we, we don't think there's a sex specific effects. And the age we we did, we set for um, for like a more kind of a young adult juvenile age where the retinal circuits are known to mature. Uh, we use like a one to two month old uh, mice. Uh, uh, but so uh, the, uh, a relevant question would be the developmental profile of this plasticity. So this has been uh, studied in Marla Feller's group where they see that this uh, depressing synaptic depression between the stubbers and ganglion cell is already present uh, 
as soon as the synaptic connectivity uh, is made. Um, so so this, this property arises, the synaptic depression arises early in development. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Jian Young, do you want to ask your question? Sure. Uh, ah, oh, yeah, oh, thank yeah. you very much. Um, my question is that do you see um, stoppers, do stopper synapses have a similar synaptic depression? Yeah, this is a great question. And uh, so because we we think during the noise will activate the stopper cell to depress the transmitter release. So this, this depression is very well characterized between stubbers and ganglion cell. And uh, it hasn't been well characterized between neighboring stubber cell. But, uh, but you're right, it's, I, we think it's highly likely that there's also depression between neighboring stubber cells. So, so when there's noise in the background, the stubbers, the lateral inhibition among stubber cells is, is affected and may also have some degree of synaptic depression. But, uh, but whatever that residual inhibition from neighboring stubber cell is, can create a quite effective surround suppression. Uh, so, so I would imagine, so I, my guess would be that there, there is some depression between neighboring stubber cells, but uh, the stubber cell are very dense in the retina and they are extensively interconnected. So even with some degree of depression during the mo uh, moving stimulus as the bar move across this neutral inhibitory network, the stubber cell is still, can still receive sufficient inhibition that, that silence the noise activity. Uh, but that is an excellent question. And the reason is we still observe these very prominent surround suppression in wild type retinas with, with those intact uh, lateral inhibition. Thank you very much. Uh, can I have an, another one? Sorry about this. Sure. Uh, the stubber cells also have a piece of the choline as neurotransmitter. Do you see any uh, contribution? Yeah. yeah, yeah. That's a great question. We also checked that. Uh, so this is the detail I omitted uh, in, in the talk. So stubber cell not only release a GABA uh, into the ganglion cell, but also at least release acetylcholine, which is excitatory to the ganglion cell. But the excitatory acetylcholine release is not uh, is symmetric in both directions. And uh, and we first of all we found that when we have a noisy bar stimulus, the contribution of excitation from acetylcholine is greatly reduced. And the primary excitatory drive to the ganglion cell is from the bipolar cell uh, evoked a glutamatergic, uh, uh, glutamatergic uh, excitation. So in that case, so the stubber cell may also have some somewhat uh, reduced cholinergic excitation to the ganglion cell. But given this, this, this uh, component, this cholinergic component contributes little to the overall excitation of the ganglion cells. So that effect is, uh, is, is, uh, is not significant. And it's also not uh, effect, it's not direction selected. So meaning that uh, the, the most um, impactful uh, um, component is this inhibition from stubber cell to the ganglion cell. Great, thank you very much. Very impressive work. Thank you. Those great questions. Okay. Thanks so much, Wei. Awesome talk. And uh, so long. Do you want to introduce yeah. Chang? That's Wei. Good, beautiful work. So uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce the uh, young colleague of mine, uh, Chang Liu. Well, from Thai, you can tell uh, Chang is a physis physician scientist. Uh, he may still will see patients today, later today. So Chang is graduated from Nanjing Medical uh, University, trained as a, a physician uh, from, from bachelor degree and master degree. But after that, he became also part of a scientist and started his uh, PhD in the US at the Barrow uh, uh, Neurology Institute, what's with uh, Fudong Shi. 
So after a PhD, a neurological PhD, he started another postdoc in the immunology. So with that, he, Chang has interesting dual background with neurological disorder and immunology. So after he come back to China, start his own lab in uh, Tianjin Medical University, as well as a clinical practice, I believe. So uh, he started his uh, uh, research on uh, interesting background, interesting aspect is immunology, as uh, cell biology during um, during the most common neurological disorder like stroke. So for the last couple of years, he has uh, lines of amazing work to uh, tell us how the natural killer cells, uh, some other immunocells work in during the, uh, the neurological disorders. Uh, so uh, today we will talk about the immunology. So you will see uh, in, in the intracerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage from bench to clinic. Welcome, Chang. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the nice introduction by uh, Zilong. So uh, I really appreciate such a great opportunity to interact with the neuroscience community here. So uh, uh, can you guys see my uh, shared screen? Yeah, sure, oh, sure, great. go ahead. Good. So, uh, my lab actually uh, working on the crosstalk between the central nervous system and the immune system. Uh, particularly, we, uh, uh, we, we pay attention to uh, major disease. One is a classical uh, autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, another is a stroke. Because in both diseases, uh, inflammation kick in from the very beginning and uh, play a, a major role during the disease uh, evolution. So, uh, OK. so. So uh, today I'm going to start from uh, some basic concept in the neuroinflammation. And, uh, uh, and from that on, I will uh, uh, walk through uh, the immune basis of uh, uh, the hemorrhagic stroke, intracerebral hemorrhage, and uh, some potential immune intervention in ICH studies. So what is neuroinflammation? Neuroinflammation has been uh, deemed as a, ma a major um, pathological uh, event shared by various um, neurological disorders and uh, could be useful for uh, the better understanding of disease pathogenesis, uh, diagnosis, treatment, and prevention. So uh, a central event of, uh, uh, a central uh, process of uh, neuroinflammation is the entry of peripheral leukocyte into the central nervous system. So how does the peripheral leukocyte get into the system, the central nervous CNS? So uh, typically, um, so the CNS, we, we have a barrier, uh, blood brain barrier protect the CNS from uh, excessive entry uh, of the peripheral immune cell during the physiologic condition, except the choroid plexus with a, a slight, uh, slightly higher immunity during the uh, physiologic condition. But uh, if there is a, a disease like a, a acute brain injury or a stroke, there is a disruption of blood brain barrier. Then the peripheral uh, immune cells, not just the lymphocytes and also monocytes uh, and the neutrophil and other Myelocell cells, well, they can get into the CNS and uh, facilitate the neuroinflammation to uh, initiate the process. So uh, why the leukocyte get into the CNS is so important. One classical disease in the uh, autoimmunity is uh, multiple sclerosis. Such a disease, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis is uh, uh, the number one disabling neurological disorder of young adults. So in such a disease, uh, here is a, a classical scenario of how the immune system get activated in the multiple sclerosis. So the CNS antigen was presented to the uh, peripheral lymphocytes, the T and the B cell by antigen presenting cell. Then there will be the generation of autoreactive T and B cell. Those cells uh, are capable of uh, recognize, um, they can recognize um, the CNS antigen. So when they have a chance getting to the infiltrate into the CNS, they will get reactivated then start to attack the mining structure because they are mining uh, specific cells and uh, cause the demyelination damage in the CNS during the early acute phase of the disease. And during the later disease, they can even uh, cause a neurodegeneration with time going on. So when the immune cell get into the CNS, they will be exposed to a, a, a different environment, uh, different, different from uh, the periphery because uh, the environmental factor and the cellular constitutes in the, within the CNS is quite different from the periphery. For example, the neurotransmitter, the cytokine and the chemokine level, and uh, in the brain there are neurons and the glial cells, those are all differ from, uh, greatly from other uh, immune organs or peripheral other uh, tissue cells. So ideally the immune cell, when they get into the CNS, they will have a new feature different on the periphery. Um, we will affect their phenotype function, which is called uh, 
uh, organ specific feature of the immune cell in their uh, fate and the function will be determined by the environmental factor. So now we come back to stroke. Stroke is a leading cause of uh, death and disability worldwide. So uh, uh, the majority of stroke are ischemic, which means there is a collusion of blood vessel within the, within the brain called the ischemia. Um, there is about 15% of all stroke cases are hemorrhagic. So today we are going to talk about intracerebral hemorrhage, which means there is a, a blood vessel rupture within uh, the brain parenchyma called a hematoma formation and uh, further brain damage, which is uh, often uh, more lethal and uh, uh, more deadly than the ischemic stroke. So if we look at the, uh, the clinical picture, the test scan, so, uh, so what will happen after uh, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage ICH occurs? After ICH occurs, there will be a hematoma formation, which means the blood component will form a clot within the brain. So with time going on, the clot uh, size may expand and also, if we look at the, uh, the tissue surrounding the, uh, the hematoma, uh, there is a, uh, if we uh, do the CAT scan and quantify the volume, which is called the perihematoma edema, which means the clot, the hematoma can cause a mass effect, which is the primary injury to push the tissue around and cause further tissue damage. So the PHE, the volume can be quantified. And right now, it can serve as a clinical marker to predict uh, the patient outcome. So if we look at the numbers, uh, the PHE can increase during the early disease, uh, uh, after hours after disease onset, and then continue to, uh, to increase uh, until uh, over the course of the disease, which means they may serve as uh, not just a disease marker and also a therapeutic target. Uh, fortunately for ICH, right now we have no specific drug for the effective treatment, not for yet. So if we look at the uh, pathological events occur after ICH, inflammation has its uh, unique feature because inflammation can initiate early after ICH onset, starting many to hours after disease onset, and it can last for uh, days or even weeks or months uh, uh, throughout the disease course. So uh, if we target neuroinflammation, which may provide a uh, possible approach uh, to, affect, to affect the disease progression or recovery. So how the immune system get activated in the uh, in stroke, for example, ICH, particular ICH. Um, so when the, uh, when the stroke onset, when stroke occurs in the brain, so there is a tissue injury, ideally cell death. After cell death, uh, the cell, uh, 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 the content like a danger signal, including uh, the cell debris and uh, 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 the product released by the dead cell or uh, uh, injured cell, uh, and, and other factors will activate the local glia uh, within the CNS, including astrocyte and microglia. And those glial cell will uh, uh, release uh, abundant chemokines. So the chemokines will recruit uh, leukocytes from the periphery. From the uh, broken, uh, from a uh, uh, from a damaged blood brain barrier, the neutrophils, the monocytes, and lymphocytes, they will rush into the CNS, work together with the glial cells, and uh, uh, propagate the neuroinflammation, cause further disease damage, uh, for the tissue damage. So this scenario is different from the uh, the classical autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis, because in that disease, the immune system, the activation starts from the periphery, but here. The primary onsite, uh, uh, the primary site of injury is within the brain. So the immune system activation starts from the brain. So our lab uh, uh, used to work on the natural killer cells. We have been uh, working on these cells because uh, uh, these cells uh, uh, comprise of the first line of immune defense and can produce a large amount of burst uh, release of uh, interferon gamma and other key. Uh, uh, factor to uh, initiate and drive inflammation process. So it's a, it's a innate cell that can kick in during the early phase of a tissue inflammation. So a, a better understanding about the natural killer cell may provide opportunity to, uh, uh, to uh, provide a further insight of, a, of the inflamm inflammatory process. So here is just a typical image. For, for example, if we look at the gym cell image staining, we can see the mononucleic cells uh, the natural killer cell, and if we under the EM uh, image, we can see the, uh, the granules which containing uh, uh, cytotoxic uh, uh, vesicles, uh, 
uh, within the uh, cell bodies. So, uh, so to understand uh, the immune component, their potential impact on the parahematoma tissue uh, uh, injury. So uh, in the clinic, so in the ER room, uh, in the emergency room, when patient with intracerebral hemorrhage, hemorrhage um, they often needed to undergo certain surgery, like uh, to, uh, to open skull to remove or the hematoma uh, evacuation to remove the hematoma. So for example, if in that surgery, we, we have a chance to, to have it a little bit tissue because during the evacuation, there is some uh, tissue residue on the, uh, on the tubing. So uh, if we do the staining of the tissue, we can see a various uh, kind of uh, uh, immune cell subset uh, during the uh, disease, uh, during the early phase of disease. Um, that, that means within 24 hours of the disease onset. If we look at the, the different immune subset uh, among the various the leukocyte subset that come from the peripheral getting into the CNS, we can see the natural killer cells uh, as the most abundant one during the early phase of the disease. So in mouse models of ICH, so we, to induce that model, we usually, introduce, uh, we, we usually inject a uh, uh, collagenase into the, uh, the brain parenchyma to create a hematoma. So the mouse uh, model actually can reproduce some of the feature of the human disease. So if we look at the mouse model, we, we use the single cell sequencing technique to measure the molecular feature of natural killer cells within the uh, ICH brain and uh, those cells, those natural killer cells still remain in the periphery. If we do the comparison, uh, we, uh, we go to this uh, table, we can see uh, uh, especially the cytotoxicity molecules uh, and the uh, chemokine uh, signatures are upregulated by natural killer cells when they get into the brain, which means, so in the ICH brain, the natural killer cells become more toxic and uh, they are able to produce uh, chemokines to affect the inflammatory responses. So, uh, so uh, we, we have performed other studies uh, to, uh, to test our hypothesis, hypothesis. Here is a, a diagram to summarize our major finding on this uh, project. What we found is after the onset of ICH, surrounding the hematoma tissue, so uh, there is a natural killer cell uh, getting the CNS from the periphery. And once they get into the, the brain parenchyma, they, they release the chemokine and the cytotoxic molecule to cause further damage of the blood brain barrier and they recruit, recruit neutrophil to uh, uh, to facilitate, to accelerate the expansion of the parahematoma edema, which means uh, those cells are detrimental during the early disease, uh, uh, disease stage. So, uh, so after we identify natural killer cell as one of the detrimental immune component in the acute ICH injury, so we, 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 we sought to understand if there are other immune components that may affect the disease uh, progression, but uh, may, may, maybe they have a different role. Uh, so uh, one example is uh, the bone marrow. The bone marrow is a central immune organ within the immune system. It, it's, a, it's called a central because it, it's, a, it, it's a major source of most of the immune cells. Uh, for example, the, uh, uh, the, the bone marrow can uh, produce like uh, 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 10 to 100 billion of neutrophil or monocytes in a single day. Uh, try to replace the cells because those cells, the lifespan is really short. Unlike neuron, neuron may have a lifespan for months or years or even life, lifetime, but uh, immune cells mostly they have a really short lifespan and uh, usually for those uh, innate cells, they need to be replaced. And uh, our hem hematopoietic uh, 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 system is quite busy all the time around. So particularly in the bone marrow, we produce a large amount of cells and go to every part of the uh, peripheral organs. So, but we have no idea how bone marrow responds to neural injury because all the uh, all the immune organ and the uh, hematopoietic system is actually tightly regulated by the nervous system. But uh, we still don't know their response to the after to the acute neural injury. To answer that question, so we uh, we went back to the ER room because uh, I mentioned in the in the acute surgery uh, for the acute ICH, some patient when need uh, they need to the hematoma uh, evacuation. Uh, in that case, uh, we can uh, we can harvest some cells within the bone marrow uh, with a bone flap from the, the skull bone. Um, so after wash out the bone marrow sample, we can harvest a, a limited amount, but uh, sufficient for the flow cytometry analysis. It's a technique try to analyze the cell number from uh, from the bone marrow. 
So if we look at the analysis, we can find, uh, so a particularly, uh, we feel very interesting because uh, we, we found uh, a, a, a population of uh, bone marrow cell, which is called the hematopoietic stem cells. So which, which, uh, which are called the stem cell because they can, they have a uh, capability to produce all kinds of uh, immune cell and the downstream like progenitor and a mature lymphocyte and a myelo cell. Ideally, if we have uh, a few uh, hematopoietic stem cells, we can reproduce the entire immune system because those cells have a strong capability to proliferate and self limit So uh, we found a, a strong uh, proliferation of uh, uh, hematopoietic stem cells after ICH onset in the bone marrow system. And, uh, uh, and also uh, because the stem cell they will produce myelot cell or lymphocytes. If we look at the specific myelot cell progenitor, we found an increase of myelot cell progenitor cells together with the stem cell uh, increase. But uh, uh, obviously, we saw uh, a reduced number of lymphocyte progenitor, which means so the hematopoietic system actually go different ways after the, the brain injury. So we go back to the, uh, to the mouse model, the ICH mouse model. So in such a model, we, we saw the similar phenomenon, which means after ICH occur, uh, we can see an increased number of uh, hematopoietic stem cells. And also uh, if we compare uh, the number of myelot cell progenitor, we also see a, a large increase of uh, 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 myelot progen uh, progenitor cells, which means the myelot, myelot cell production has been increased of the ICH onset. So, so why this is important? I mean, so if we see the increase of myelot cell production, so what will happen? I mean, so, uh, so what will uh, happen to the, to the product? Of the bone marrow, it, it, uh, we will the will the output of bone marrow of a different cell will be uh, will be different uh, from the physiology condition. Will they affect the brain? So that's our question. To answer that question, we use a transgenic mouse lab. So that mouse we uh, uh, allow us to uh, to perform line lineage tracing of hematopoietic stem cell, which is a, a technique to allow. Uh, if we inject tamoxifen to induce the TD tomato depression of the uh, hematopoietic stem cells, and those cells will continue to, uh, uh, to, uh, to express uh, uh, TD tomato during the uh, self renew and the differentiation. Which means, so if we uh, inject, inject the mice with uh, tamoxifen, we can induce uh, the TD tomato in the HSC and all, the, all their downstream cell lineage after ICH onset. So with that approach, so uh, we, we induce the TD tomato depression in the all lineage of newly uh, produced immune cell from the bone marrow after ICH onset. And if we perform a flow cytometry analysis, uh, we can look at the result and see actually after ICH onset, uh, the, uh, the product of the bone marrow is a LY60 low monocyte. Uh, and their uh, progenitors and uh, uh, the stem cell. So which means uh, the final outcome for the bone marrow uh, hematopoiesis increase is the uh, LY60 low monocyte. And those monocytes uh, conventionally think they have regulatory function and reduce inflammation. So if we look at the brain and those regulatory monocytes can actually get into the brain and, and produce uh, interleukin 10 and other uh, immune regulatory factor, factor to suppress uh, acute inflammation. So we uh, because uh, uh, the, the immune system is tightly controlled by the central nervous system, one major pathway is a synthetic innovation um, through catecholamine pathway. So our, our group have been studying on those pathways for, uh, for, uh, for year to decade. So, um, um, so when there is one way to, uh, to enhance the adrenergic activation, because we, we believe ICH, after ICH, uh, the adrenergic activation actually causes this uh, self-protective effect of bone marrow. So if we use a, a method to uh, use a pharmacological approach to stimulate, stimulate the bone marrow through the uh, adrenergic receptor, can we have a protective effect? So that's our question. To test, that, to test this question, we use a, a beta-3 agonist um, 
It's called a mirabagrin. It's, it's a drug uh, approved by FDA um, to uh, this drug target a beta-3 receptor because that receptor is highly depressed by bone marrow cells. Um, so if we use uh, uh, that drug and uh, to treat the mice, we can see the reduced neurological deficit after ICH. And if we look at the new neural image, uh, those are MRI image. If we look at the image, we can see the reduced volume of perihome hematoma edema uh, after ICH onset, which means so if we uh, stimulate the bone marrow and uh, increase the production of uh, IOI-60 low, the regulatory monocyte, we can surprise uh, the neuroinflammation and the brain injury. So here is uh, uh, the summary of, the, uh, of this project. What we found is uh, after brain injury, uh, the adrenergic innovation stimulated the bone marrow, caused the bone marrow hematopoietic stem cell to proliferate and produce increased number of regulatory monocytes. And those monocytes, home into the injured CNS and produce uh, immune regulatory cytokine, including IL-10, and reduce uh, neural injury after ICH. So, uh, so our study uh, uh, proposed a, a, a complex of immune system, which means on one arm, there's a detrimental effect. On the, arm, the other arm, there's some uh, protective effect. Different immune components play different roles and, uh, during the disease uh, process. So uh, is there any way uh, in the clinic we can do something I mean, to, uh, to stop uh, the detrimental inflammation, especially during the early disease phase and uh, try to achieve a better outcome? So we, we noticed there is one drug, it's a, a called a Fungoli model, it's a S1P receptor modulator. This drug has been approved by FDA to treat multiple sclerosis since uh, 2010. Uh, the mechanism action of this drug is to uh, uh, when the chemical bound with a, a receptor depressed by the uh, lymphocytes, because this drug mostly ta target the lymphocytes, ideally T and B cell. So those lymphocytes will be, uh, um, uh, and, uh, and the natural killer cell as well. And those lymphocytes will be uh, fixed within the lymphoid organ, and they cannot, which means they cannot leave uh, uh, the lymph node or spleen or other places, so they will not be able to infiltrate into the CNS during the early disease stage. So, uh, so if we, we give the patient this drug, we can shield the brain from the uh, lymphocyte invasion uh, during the uh, early disease phase. And so, um, so in collaboration with other PIs, and uh, uh, um, so there is a one, uh, one uh, uh, early phase clinical trial performed uh, at the Tianjin General Hospital by the investigators here. And uh, published a year ago, they show uh, the uh, the protective effect of fungolimod uh, on the uh, early stage uh, uh, intracerebral hemorrhage on the patient. It's a, a small scale study, and uh, and and from that on, um, from that time on, uh, and uh, there are a couple of other study, uh, one is ongoing, uh, two are ongoing, and uh, using uh, similar drugs, a more selective in second generation auto MP uh, modulator. Uh, ongoing and uh, there are another drug uh, it's still using the Fingoli mode with uh, larger samples and uh, uh, with a different cohorts going. So we uh, we look forward to see the results in the future uh, the future years and hopefully there will be some uh, uh, interesting finding. So overall, uh, the immune modulation uh, right now uh, in the ICH still at its early stage. Um, still need a further testing, but it has the potential to reduce pyrohemicoma edema and improve the disease outcome. So here I'm going to thank my uh, colleague, my friend and the collaborator, also the funding and, and, um, and for their support uh, for to perform those projects. And here the picture show the, uh, the hospital, uh, the changing general hospital, uh, our clinic, uh, our inpatient Ward is at uh, floor 89, and uh, my lab is at uh, 21 to 22. So actually, they're in the same building. So, and, uh, um, and thank you for your attention. I'll be happy to take any questions. Great. Great. Thanks, John. Let's do the talk. I'll open for questions. Sean, maybe I'll go with the first question. Okay. So um, there was a very re recent report that um, infection with Epstein-Barr virus is a major 
cause for multiple sclerosis mm-hmm. now. And um, there were some sort of hints of that around, but I think now it's, it's that evidence is really compelling. And I'm just wondering, like, it's, if, if in your clinical experience, your research experience, if you've seen other connections between viral infections wow. and um, sort of neurological impairments, it seems like this is a major finding. Yeah, so about uh, multiple sclerosis research, it has been uh, uh, for many decades there is a hypothesis. I mean, the, the virus infection is a uh, is a, a major cause or a trigger of such a disease. But uh, uh, there there are some report, but uh, there's the field still need very definite answer or evidence to support that hypothesis. I think the recent science paper I mean provide a, a further a further clue, new clue to such a hypothesis, and there's still require more solid, especially clinical evidence to, to prove that. And, uh, but anyway, I mean, I mean it's, uh, it's theoretically, it's, it's highly likely uh, possible. Um, and uh, in the clinical wheel, uh, patient, if they have a systemic infection, I mean, not just a virus, even bacteria, other disease, um, so caused by uh, infectious condition, they will facilitate uh, the, they could serve as a trigger of many neurological disorders. Um, Including multiple sclerosis, so there is a uh, so there is a uh, so clinically it's, it seems very possible. Got it. It seems like it, um, in your hospital or together with other hospitals, you, you would be in a great position to try to test some of those hypotheses with a large number of patients and samples, especially longitudinal samples. Uh, yeah, yeah. So th- th- that's possible because right now the the EB virus uh, the, the test is available in the in the clinic. So I, actually, yeah. there, there are several reports already show uh, in the MS patients or similar. There is another disease, a more uh, has a higher incidence in the MS, but very similar. It's called the uh, MO neuromyelitis optica. So that disease uh, is similar to MS, but a higher incidence in the in the Asian. So um, so people have tested uh, the uh, the chance of uh, EB virus uh, positivity compare uh, with uh, uh, with MO, MS, and uh, and and healthy individuals. So they see in the uh, not just MS, also in the MO, people have a higher chance to have a, a positive uh, EB virus. So if we run that, that test, so it's uh, it may not be coincidence. I, I think there there could be some connection. Yeah. Great. Uh, you have no more questions? I thank uh, Wei and Chang for a great talk today. Great. Nice to see you. It's a long time. Great. Hey, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thanks very much. Take care. Take care. Thanks, Wei.